uh, get to give you a whistle stop tour of our lab, uh, what it's done, what it plans to do, why we are, who we are, what we're doing, and what we plan to do next. Now, I'm pretty sure I've broken the template, which gives me all the time in the world. <laughs> we live in the outer atmosphere of our star. That star is a turbulent, convecting, nasty mess driven by its magnetic field. That magnetic field drives the entire solar system, but not only driving that solar system, and this is where it's probably broken, it drives, see, I, I broke it. It drives our atmosphere too. Of course, we know that when the sun gets up in the morning, it gets warmer, and when it goes to sleep at night, it gets cooler. And in general, in fact, the sun doesn't really do much to the Earth other than buff it continuously with radiation, particles, light, etc. But anyone, as anyone knows that this relentless buffeting is called space weather. Space weather comes from our star, and our star is dominated. I have definitely this broken it. Is really a miniature model of all things: the Earth, Sun, trees, cells. Everything is shaped by magnetic fields. Who knows Maxwell's equations? Hands up. Okay. <laughs> The Earth's magnetic field is coupled to the Sun's magnetic field, and our atmosphere is therefore coupled to that. What HEO does is NCAR's Solar Terrestrial Physics Lab it studies the complex magnetothermal interface between the Sun and the Earth. Now, back in the 1940s, some smart farts in Washington discovered that when the Sun had an eruption, it destroyed the ability for people to communicate to people in the field. Smart guy, showing bottom right, called Walter Roberts, was positioned in a mountaintop in Colorado. He reported back to Washington on what he saw in the sun, who then relayed it out into the field. Um, Walt was truly a pioneer. That pioneering work set aside 75 years of work, multiple observatories, both ground-based, space-based, etc., instrumentation technology development, Theoretical developments a galore. These are just some of the things that we worked on, have worked on, are working on. They span the full magnetothermal environment, that 93 million mile stretch from the sun to the earth. I'm ahead of schedule. Of course, HEO is more than just science. HEO is about its people. We had a gathering here at the start of last month to, to think about the thousand-something people who've worked actively there over the 75 years. But back to Walt's vision and the impacts and the origins of HAO, that in our technologically dominated world, satellites are vulnerable to space weather. They're also vulnerable to what we call space climate. Our power grid system is vulnerable to space weather. <laughs> I'm going to pause. Take a breath. <laughs> Where do you live? <laughs> All right. Who ran up an ATM bill today? That thing critically depends on GPS timing. GPS satellites are critically dependent on space weather. If the sun farts, those satellites get disturbed. You could be, end up being charged one nano cent more for your transaction. What are the grand challenges for HEO in this technological society? Well, we need to understand the processes that drive that space weather. We still don't know. We know it's the magnetic field, but not how it connects. But then to go a step further and understand how it connects to climate. How does the troposphere and interplanetary space connect? To do that, we need new observations. Two things here. One's Cosmo, big one, which is our project. And on the top right is DKIST, D -K -I -S -T, the biggest solar telescope ever built. But in order to understand those data chunks, that massive data volume, you need new modeling strategies. And so upstairs, we're developing new model strategies to understand how to interpret the photons that get captured by those huge telescopes. That's a really crucial interpretive aid to doing what we do. If you can't understand the observations, in my view, there's no point in building the observatory. Did I say that in Jim standing over? But the other crucial part is the feedback between the modeling activities and the observations themselves. So if you want to improve forecast skill, as Bill told us, you need to have a critical feedback between observation and model 
to improve your ability to figure out what's going to happen next in a similar set of circumstances. And so we're actually working to piece our, our little pieces of modeling infrastructure together to give us a better insight. You know, one of the things I'm particularly proud of, and this is a pretty recent activity, is to show how the tropospheric evolution, or, or weather down here, couples to the weather 100 kilometers above our head. This is something that I'm going to have to shoot you because you're not meant to see it. It's our newest evolution or, or, of how the ionosphere, the piece that Bill and his RO is trying to sample, how you see tropospheric variations. So things from down here affecting the upper atmosphere above, which is also being coupled from the sun. So the ionosphere is this real nexus between the sun and the earth. Pretty fascinating place. It's also the place where all your satellites fly. So if you've got a tropical storm, that thing can have devastating global impact to little subtle variations in the Earth's upper atmosphere that scatter communications, etc. I think I did break it. I'm, I'm proud of that. But another crucial piece of our mission is to educate and to engage. And so in 2017 and 2024, there are literally two once-in-a-lifetime events seven years apart, that are going to straddle our whole country. These are total solar eclipses. We will have a field campaign for one and other activities around the other, where there are likely to be upwards of about 100 million citizen scientists out there intrigued about what the sun is and how it impacts our planet on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm done. Thank you. <laughs>